This episode of the Cult Pop Show podcast was brought to you by our Patreon. If you want to tell us which films we should watch, get up to two extra exclusive podcasts a month, give us something to talk about in the post credit scene at the end of each episode, or join us for our monthly movie club Zoom call where we discuss a film together, then please consider joining the cult and donating at www.patreon.com slash cultpopshow. Hey, what's up everybody? Welcome along to the Cult Pop Show podcast. This is a little intro section before the episode starts. This is, of course... Um, our annual most disappointing films of the year uh we did part one earlier in the year um because we were like let's split this up into each half of the year instead of doing them in four massive episodes by the end or however it was that we did it um and so you would think that would mean that by and large our episodes would get shorter we'd be we'd be we'd be more efficient at this but it doesn't and this is actually part two of three there are (laughs) three most disappointing films um episodes this year in a year where nothing really came out um and of course by most disappointing we actually mean it's an episode that we talk about every movie that we saw this year and then crown the most disappointing um midway through or during it so because of that the episode will end somewhat abruptly but i'll be back at the end to do an outro um and of course the post credit scene uh and also This is also, well, both of these next two episodes will be very show notes heavy. If you go to the show notes below, you will see um, all the time codes for what we talk about and when we talk about it, if you want to avoid spoilers. um, Although, from memory, we're only spoiler specific on certain movies that we usually signpost ahead of time. But, you know, whether you care or not, look in the show notes for that. And in the show notes, you will also find uh, the letterboxed rankings for mine and Richard's um, top, you know, our rankings of 2020. So let's get to it. I hope you guys enjoy the episodes um, and let us know uh, what your most disappointing film of the year was you can actually do that on our discord you can talk directly to us there'll be a link to the discord in the show notes and everyone more people should join the discord more people should join the discord because you just get to chat with us and with all our friends and all our little community so get on there let's have a discussion about 2020 in cinema um and we will see you next week for part two so i guess that letterbox ranking will be spoilers for how we ranked everything but you could have also checked it at any time of the year anyway let's get to the episode and i'll see you at the end do you want to start or should i start hey all you cool cats and kittens remember 2020 hey remember 2020 what a year what a year god I'm desperately sure trying to remember a Tiger King reference, but it's actually been scrubbed from my mind from everything else that's happened. So, yeah, thanks, man. Yeah, Tiger King is up there for the most disappointing things I watched in 2020. <laughs> Could have been two, two episodes shorter. I'm sorry. <laughs> Do you know what, Richard? Could have not made it. I watched first episode and then gave up, so... I liked it even less than you did. And uh, once again, AJ has proven that he's more woke than the rest of us that's right hi and i'm jeremy (laughs) why is that more woke (laughs) what does that have to do with anything Uh, i'm richard and i'm aj and look i am more woke (laughs) if you're worried that you have to remember 2020 don't worry you actually need to remember the last half of 2020 however i understand that that might still be somewhat of a feat because each half of 2020 felt like its own year. Decade. Yeah, all Decade. Like nine <laughs> halves of 2020. <laughs> um, so this is, of course, the Cold Popshire podcast where we're bringing you our one, an, an annual tradition, um, one that I enjoy more than Netflixmas, <laughs> um, and that is our most disappointing films of the year rundown. This is, of course, part two. We did part one rundown. in the middle of the year. Oh, bloody rundown at the end of 2020. <laughs> hey, let's see how many more like redundant 2020 jokes we can make. Redundant? Like- oh, yeah. Talk about all the people at my work that got made redundant. <laughs> oh, <far out. laughs> Yikes. Oh, my God. No, no, no. It's um, about entertainment, Richard, not about well, real life. Entertainment. There's an industry that's bloody struggling. <laughs> oh, crap. No. <laughs> 
I mean, it's about it's about traveling outside of the norm. <laughs> Travel. Oh, no. Okay. <laughs> no, it's it's about it's about like sitting down, cracking open maybe a Corona and just, <laughs> just really. <laughs> Alrighty, enough of this tomfoolery. We've actually got to get down to business because the reason we split these podcasts up into multiple parts, one in the middle of the year, one at the end of the year, is because when we don't do that, we sit here till 4am. It's currently quarter to 10. But if we don't split it up, we sit here until the early hours of the morning. Yeah. Um, talking about movies, we kind of remember. Um, <laughs> with with the each each year, uh, the, the goal has, to, has been to crown the most disappointing film of the year and of course the only way to do that is to go through every single major release that came out in the year this has always been our secret um content farm. Long wrap up yeah mm. <laughs> um, and i think that uh I think it's probably still Doolittle, but there are. There are <laughs> no, no Doolittle's think, the worst film of the year. I don't yeah, know. That's yes. What, what a portent yes. for what was to come. <laughs> yeah. Pulling bagpipes out of a dragon's ass. Yeah, who, who would have thought that would be one of my highlights of the year was seeing that in the cinema? When I reviewed that movie, um, I, I wrote at the end of it 2020 is cursed um, because I thought the movie was so bad, and I was right. Wow. So. It was not not my fault. It was Doolittle's fault. Um, but yeah, so there will be. I, I probably have put a intro at the start of this episode, but in case I haven't, there will be in the show notes. You'll find time codes for each of the movies we talk about because we will be dealing in spoilers for some, but not necessarily for all. Depending on if it's a spoilable movie, if everyone in in the podcast has has seen the movie, because we yeah. respect you know not wanting to know spoilers and um, also if aj if you don't put um you can cut this out but if you don't put frames on the um time codes then it's much easier to skip through on youtube because you can just click on it if it's just don't put fr- fr- oh, no, i'd usually i usually take frames off did i not take frames oh, yeah, off yeah because i was trying to find uh a little bit that jeremy and i made last year <laughs> um uh which will uh reach its zenith you just you just turned this from a discussion about technical matters of the podcast to podcast content. So now AJ now isn't going to be able to, to cut out that random chat <laughs> because you talked about what's anyway. going to happen yeah, in the podcast. I, yeah, People I, like it. I know AJ well enough to know that if I go, oh, you can cut this out, it's staying. <laughs> <laughs> Whenever I want to make a really important point, I'll say you can cut this out. Um, and then I know that it's coming in. I literally explode with paradox. I can't figure out how to do it. Uh, all right, so where we last left our heroes and um, at the start of July, um, yeah, we, we were talking about King of Staten Island was the most recent release. Oh. Um, we were supposed to be looking forward to Top Gun Maverick and In the Heights, but <laughs> COVID had other plans. Um, but it, we mm. did get, uh, it was supposed to actually come out earlier and uh, to coincide with the contest it's named after but eurovision song contest the story of fire saga was released on netflix uh at the start of july uh i watched this film jeremy did you watch this film oh yes i did okay and aj you watched it as well yes ah what a, a great a start sleeper. um so i watched this movie so spoilers galore <laughs> <laughs> uh if you have any intention of watching eurovision song contest the story of fire saga do not listen any further <laughs> <laughs> um so yeah, what did everyone think of this film? Uh, I I really enjoyed it. I thought this was. I, I remember like when the trailer came out. I might have even said it on the mid year one, but this looks so stupid. Like, well, it didn't just look so stupid. For the first fifteen minutes, I yeah. was just like, oh man. I think I was even messaging you guys when I was watching because yeah. you had you had messaged me and said, oh my god, watch it. You have well, to yeah, watch cause it because I, I messaged both of you. I was like, oh, this this is actually pretty good. So AJ went and watched it. Was like, Pfft. and I was like, no, I want. I wasn't meeting you, AJ. I just want Jeremy to watch it. <laughs> and I was just like, I was messaging you and I was just like, Will Ferrell needs to stop. For the first 15 minutes of the movie, I was just like, he needs to stop making movies. He's not funny anymore. I can't stand this awful dreck. And then I'm pretty sure it was the moment when um, when the boat the boat that all the um, uh, Iceland competitors were on exploded in the water and they were watching and she was like, oh no! And he's like, the elves, they've gone too far. (laughs) Like, I fucking lost my shit (laughs) laughing at that line. And from then on, I was just 
part of it. I was in the movie yeah. and I went with it and I had such a good time. Yeah. It was just a classic. And I, it made me realize how long it's been since I've actually watched just a stupid comedy yeah. that whole purpose for existing was to make me laugh. Yeah. And it did. And I loved it. Yeah. Uh, AJ, what were you going to say? I was going to say that, Richard, you started that with like, oh, the trailer looks so stupid. And Jeremy was like, oh, the first 15 minutes. And I was like, no, 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 gentlemen, it was stupid. And the whole movie was bad. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know where you're getting this this breath of fresh air that everyone claimed this movie. And to be honest, though, I think this is one of those things where like the narrative was um, you think it's going to be real bad, but it's actually really good. That's what I was told. Went into it expecting that it wasn't that, so it flipped back around to no, it's actually just just really bad. <laughs> um, I watched this with a friend who doesn't watch a lot of movies, um, and I was like, "This is supposed to be really good." We watched it, and by the end, I was like, "Hey, man, I'm I'm really sorry." <laughs> <laughs> like it was like it was it was awkward. It, it was so bad that it was an awkward time with my friend um yeah. watching it do you know that uh how, how old are you willing to believe rachel mcadams uh, or how old or young yeah this you this, this was the thing because i watched this with my wife <laughs> insert my wife's thing here um no nah, that's too dated it's so so dated um but i watched this with my wife and <laughs> boy it will never be popular in li- like- <laughs> <laughs> such a dated reference um no so she she was watching it with me and she just kept on saying every time there was anything romantic between Rachel McAdams and Will Ferrell, she was like, how, how are they expecting us to believe this? Like how, 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 how did anyone ever think it would be okay? But I'm like, for me, I'm like, that's part of the comedy. Yeah. And also the fact that like they've known each other since when they were little kids. And like, I like, I would believe that Will Ferrell's like, 50 and Rachel McAdams is like 40. But the thing is, that's, that's, not, the actual ages. <laughs> well, that's no, not what it is though. No, Should because the when, they're little, when they're little kids, they're like three or four years apart. Okay. Max. Well, maybe they're like 42 and 46. And he's a real old 46. Yeah. They shot themselves in the foot by making them childhood friends, I yes. think. Because if, if they weren't that, it's just like they're whatever age they are. Yeah. But because of the, they were shown to be kids together, it's like, listen, I and no offense, no offense to Will Ferrell, you do not look any younger than 50 at 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 the youngest. And Rachel McAdams, I could probably believe, is young as early 30s. Right. Um you know, and but they certainly don't look the same age. And also to to uh, your wife's point. Um, Jeremy, I think part of it as well is that the the story for a lot of it is that Rachel McAdams has a crush on Will Ferrell, and it's not like a reciprocated thing for yeah. a long time. But again, like yeah. that is part of the comedy. Yes, I think. but like so, in defense of this film, uh, because I I loved it. I thought I thought it was the great. the defense the defense that two thirds of this conversation is in, in favor of. Well, yeah, but you you know you guys are shitting on it. So, but in, like. <laughs> I know I've spoken in the past about like against the idea of like a turn your brain off film, but like Jeremy said, it was like, I was in the mood and you know, it was fucking 2020. It was mid 2020. I'm sorry for wanting to laugh. We'd come out of lockdown. We needed something. Yeah. And, but like, it was literally just a film I could put on and once I gave myself over to it and the whole thing of like the elves and Demi Lovato coming back from the dead to (laughs) warn Will Ferrell that the bad guy's bad, which he's just found out. And he's like, what a terrible ghost. Um, What an unhelpful ghost. AJ's laughing. Um, But um, apart from, apart from anything else, I loved the music in this film. Like oh. the Volcano Man, which is supposed to be like the silly bad song, is great. Um, Double Trouble, the the one that gets them into the top ten for Eurovision. Um, and then, yeah, yeah, ding dong, yeah, yeah, ding dong, and um, Husavik, my hometown. Yeah. They're all fantastic yeah. songs, so, and that's the that's one thing that like always gets me in a movie is like when they actually make the effort to make the music good. We spoke about this when we when we did uh, Walk Hard for one of our Patreon podcasts, but it's like the music in that movie is so good, but the whole rest of the movie is so stupid. Well, and, the, and it helps you give yourself over to it because there's a sincerity to it. Yeah, what's really crazy about it is that, so I, every now and then, I think it's probably every like four years, I, I, I'm an occasional watcher of Eurovision. So about yeah. every four years, I just go, 
I'll check in on Eurovision this year yeah. because it's so ridiculous and there's just something there's I mean literally just like this movie Eurovision is batshit insane mm. and it knows it and it doesn't care yeah. and it wants to deliver you more of the batshit insaneness and so I watched last year's Eurovision which is where they filmed Eurovision yeah, so that yeah. the, the whole stadium and the the whole setup with the stage and lighting rig and everything was was what they had yeah. in last year's Eurovision and it was just so immense mm. and crazy and there are like definable types of eurovision song that come out in every competition mm. there's like the sort of cool one there's the really kitschy one there's the nordic one which is exactly what the um the, yeah, yeah no 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 not husavik it's the one that had um oh maybe it is uh, like it's the one that had like the beautiful woman singing and then like a guy who goes yeah, 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 yeah. like like the people who wrote the music for this movie understand yeah. what happens at Eurovision in such a perfect way. I was watching this being yeah. like, they have got the map of what songs come out of Eurovision every single time and they yeah. are nailing it. Like and, and genuinely, it was, it was these could be real songs. For Will Ferrell because his wife is Scandinavian. Or something. Right. And, sh and so he would go over there, like he'd lived there for six months of the year and he discovered the Eurovision Song Contest for like the last 10 years and just fell in love with it. And essentially like, you know, has been trying to get this movie made for a long time. And when he took it to the director, he was like, can we change the name? Like, you're, and, but because he'd never heard of it, you know? And like, um, and yeah, because it's not something that's really made it across to the US. We get it here a little bit, just like, you know, we're getting every other country's leftovers. But um, <laughs> well, weirdly, Australia is massively into Eurovision, yeah. so much so that they actually got invited to be part of the competition last year. Oh, nice. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Which is but like, yeah, there is a bit in this movie that's clearly for Eurovision fans where it's it has what I can only assume is like some greats because I, I, re I recognize Conchita Worst. Yeah. Um, but. Yeah, it's it's like they go to a Eurovision party and there's you what you can tell from context are like celebrity guests. Um but also we, we should move on so we don't spend there. I did two hours talking about Eurovision. But um Dan Stevens is fantastic he, in this film. He is well. amazing. He, 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 he Best part of the, the movie. The, the last thing I'll say about this movie is that uh for people who've watched it, um, this is amazing because one of my friends they, they got really into it. And the movie or your the, the movie, yeah. they got really into the movie. And so she was, the wife was playing the soundtrack over and over again. Yeah, yeah. And their son, who is three years old, um, had never seen the movie. He'd yeah. only ever heard the songs. And my friend sent me a video of his son crying when a, like there's a song from Eurovision playing <laughs> yeah. and the little boy is going, no, play ya yeah, yeah, ding dong. Play ya yeah, ya yeah, ding dong. Literally had never seen the movie, did not know that was a joke in the movie. He just genuinely wanted them to only play ya yeah, ya yeah, ding dong That's from the <laughs> Um This is also one of um two films we'll cover featuring Graham Norton. Uh, but we'll come back to that. Hmm. Now, I'm the easiest way for me to kind of do because I'm using the same list that we did for Anticipated. So um, I could talk, it's fun to look at what movies we thought we would have seen by now. Oh, right. And, um, when they're going to be released. So Minions Rise of Gru was supposed to come out July 3rd, delayed to July 2nd, 2021. Free Guy was uh, supposed to come out the same day, delayed to December 11th, now delayed again to May 21st. Um, but we got a fun, exciting thing happen. Uh, what was supposed to come out next year was Move uh, Forward, to um july 3rd hamilton uh went straight to disney plus supposed to receive a theatrical release next year um we all watched this what's what was everyone's experience with the musical the or the musical beforehand had, any, had anyone listened to it yes yeah had, had, had you aj yeah i remember when it first came out jeremy you played it to me in your car we were hanging out um, and you said you didn't like it and everyone loved it. It was this new musical. <laughs> you said, have you heard of Hamilton? And for like 10 minutes of the conversation, I thought you were talking about the city, the New Zealand city. <laughs> and ironically as well, because now, obviously not internationally, but nationally it's somewhat of a common joke now to you know, mm. make Hamilton jokes about Hamilton. Mm. Um, but the, I genuinely for a while thought you were talking something about the city. And I was like, yeah. what are you talking about? <laughs> and then you played yeah, me. Yeah, the, like, the, oh, have, you, have you heard of Hamilton? Everyone likes it, but I hate it. And you're like, everyone hates Hamilton. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, you played me the song and I was like, okay. And then 
Um, I heard the song a bunch over the years, mm. sort of vaguely grew to understand what the musical was about, but had never seen it, had never heard any other song in it. Um, yeah. Yeah, well, great great lead in, AJ, because it's totally the truth, I have to admit. And I, I said it on the most anticipated that I yeah, you did. really, really, really did not like Hamilton. Well, why would you have said it on most anticipated? Because we didn't know what was coming out this year. He said it on part one of most disappointed. Did I not? Jeremy planned COVID. No, no, no. no. We, we knew in the most disappointing, sorry, yeah. most most disappointing I know, I know, part. I know, I was just making a joke yeah. about you. <laughs> making COVID. <laughs> yeah. Um, but anyway, that, that basically I was looking forward to watching it because I wanted to see what everyone was talking about. Yeah. And boy, howdy, did I see what everyone was talking oh, about. Good, yeah, because sorry. holy, like just, I think it's unfair to listen to the music by itself. Mm. And I know that many people had the experience of listening to the album and they loved it because yeah. that they, they could really get with that kind of music. And I think in, in, in the Heights is a similar, because the other Lin-Manuel Miranda musical, similar experience, just very Lin, Lin-Manuel Miranda style of kind of the rap, rapping mm. and musical kind of mashed together. And I just didn't understand it. But man, watching it happen live on a stage with the energy mm, and being the in pow- the room where it happened. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but like the energy, the power, the quality of the performances, the acting, the the vitality of like how much is going on on stage mm. at all times. I was completely blown away by this. I watched it three times over the course of this year. It is mm. rocketed up to being one of my favorite musicals of all time. It, complete yeah. turnaround. I I I. It's similar to AJ. I'd heard the song Alexander Hamilton, um, just because you couldn't avoid it for like a year, and then I I, I had it on my like Spotify and I listened to it quite a bit, but I'd never listened to any other songs from it. Um, and then when I found out that Disney was going to be releasing it, I was like, well, now I won't listen to it until I've seen it. And so essentially, I treated it as like I know I'm going to like the music from it, and watching it is like unlocking being able to do that. And then ever since then, like for the rest of the year, wait for it was my most played song on Spotify last year. Um, but it was, um, yeah, I mean, it's fantastic. And, and the, the, I hope it paves the way for filming more musicals like that as well. Yeah. Um, getting the original cast in, doing a couple in front of an audience, and the, but then being able to really get up and close. And you can see um, just how carried by the rest of the actors Lynn Wamel Miranda is. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, like, he, he's incredibly, incredibly talented man. Um, and the, 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 the fact that this entire thing came from one person's brain is such a foreign concept. Like that's so bewildering mm. to me. Um, but, but now yes, I get um, why Leslie Odom Jr. did deserve the Tony over him. Totally. And also I now understand why at a certain point we all started seeing David Diggs everywhere because yeah. talent scouts saw him do that on stage mm. and said, we need him. Yeah. <laughs> we need him. <laughs> and he's another one that pops up later on the year as well. Same movie with Graham Norton, actually. <laughs> um Yeah, AJ. So yeah, I I I've been seeing a lot of um I guess I guess, they must be like Facebook ads or YouTube ads where it'll, there's two clips that stick in my mind and they're about Hamilton. And one of them is Jimmy uh Fallon. Is it Fallon or Kimmel? Probably Fallon. He's he's talking to Questlove. Which one's that? Oh, that's Fallon. Fallon. Unless for some um, reason Jimmy Kimmel is on the Tonight Show set <laughs> Jimmy talking Fallon. to Questlove. And it's it's like a clip from like a 2016 episode of the, of the Tonight Show, and he goes like he goes like Questlove, how how amazing is this musical? And Questlove's mm. like, oh, it's it's life changing. And I was like, man, that's so sincere, but I, yeah. I agree. And um, also, and Questlove a- also appears in that film with David Diggs <laughs> and um, Graham Norton. <laughs> Um, and there's a there's another clip of a guy going like I have more than once compared Lynn to Shakespeare and I do it without embarrassment, um, and I get it that as well like like mm. like you said it's bewildering to think that all of this came from the mind of of one person it seems um it seems impossible almost that mm. one guy could could be could spearhead this like watching this for the first time obviously obviously like viscerally really liked it um but i was still like is this the best thing i've seen this year and i sort of it's one, it was one of those things where i i didn't stop thinking about it mm. um I, but also, I it also it kind of feels like cheating as well to put it as number one yeah, yeah, 100% yeah. cuz i just put it as number one and left it all year didn't even think about dethroning it Mm. Um, but it's like it feels like cheating because it's not like i'm not like oh my god the movie was amazing it's just like well hamilton's incredible well exactly yeah. and, and also yeah. like 
it's you you credit the performers with doing it live on stage it's a completely different art form and just i guess because it just because it was released you know as a feature length mm. kind of you know thing for you to watch on a tv screen um yeah. it, it sort of puts it in that film category but i think that you know like the the discipline of of creating a musical is just so much I, I think that the bones of the creation of it are, are very much more visible on the stage than it is when you're watching a film where all that sort of stuff is kind of the whole artifice of film is that all of that is hidden. And so I think that the just watching Hamilton is much more impressive out the front there because you're seeing it all being made in front of you. I think like I, I'm i so I watched it again with my with my family because um, they were keen to see it. And it's so it's actually so beautiful and so like the themes of it are so interesting that the messages being communicated are some of the most interesting ideas I've ever seen communicated in a story before. I think, um, Aaron Burr, that's, is that, that's Leslie Odom Jr. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 He's so amazing. The, the character of Aaron Burr was such a, a human flawed character that and it i related to him so much more than hamilton because it's he's he's cautious and he's he's self-loathing and 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 foolish and um has all these yeah. regrets and the the song i think it's wait for it where he yeah. says um what was there a re- was it the line um if there's a reason i'm still alive when everyone who loves me has died i'm willing to wait for it fucking hell yeah what the fuck that is the one of the most human ideas i've ever heard expressed mm. that that i relate to that a lot and i and like talking about it i get a little bit choked up <laughs> thinking about that concept right yeah. because it, it, that that's such a crippling um moral like philosophy to to maintain like yeah. it's it's mind-blowing so I, I loved his character i loved um I loved uh, King George. Thought he was pretty funny. Mm. Jonathan Groff. Um, I will say just about about wait for it. There's a show on Netflix called Song Exploder. It's based on a podcast, um, and it's this guy interviewing different artists about how they came up with one song. So there's like an REM one about losing my religion. There's one with the Killers about when you were young. Um, but he does one with Lin Manuel Miranda, and it's about wait for it. And he, like Lin says, it's probably the best song I'll ever write. And but talking about because you also hear like a lot of his demos because he's like he talks about like he had, he like left a party early because he or he was like on his way to a party and he had inspiration so he's just like pulling out his phone and like rapping into his phone um, while walking along and they play you that that recording of him like cool. freestyling the song essentially but he talks about how because I think he relates a lot more to Hamilton and the way that they create the two characters of Hamilton and Aaron Burr um, they have such diametrically opposed viewpoints but they're neither one is really wrong because Hamilton is all about I'm not throwing away my shot and um obviously um Aaron Burr's like I'm, I'm willing to wait for it but um he talks about the the hardest part about writing this song was like well how do I dramatize waiting because it's, mm. it's not it's not an inherently theatrical thing to do whereas it's very easy to be like you know, I'm not throwing away my shot. I'm just like my country. I'm young, scrappy and hungry. But it's like, how do you make waiting sound cool? But it's like, fuck, he did it with this. This is a fucking <laughs> yeah. incredible song. It made it like profound and existential. Yeah. Um, and yeah, look, I, I think it's the, one of the best things I've ever seen and will think about it for the rest of my life. Yeah. To be like, the, not to be over dramatic, but like that, I really just was so gradually moved by it like initially it wasn't it didn't hit me it more just stayed with me and i was like shit man i i can't stop thinking about this Mm. this thing um all right so a week later we were supposed to see ghostbusters afterlife remember that oh my god Remember that they're making another (laughs) ghostbusters coming out in march next year um greyhound went straight to apple tv plus did you watch this jeremy absolutely not oh yeah (laughs) Okay, well, you were excited for it. But my parents ago. did. Um, <laughs> my parents watched it. Yeah, did they like they it? They loved it. Oh, yeah. So, well, <laughs> check it out. Every, everyone's parents watched it and loved it. Yeah. Um, Palm Springs. This was kind of, um, this is the, the hot movie of 2020 that everyone's talking about. Um, I remember this being, yeah, uh, in January, it was like the most purchase, most expensive purchase at a film festival. Um, well, there was a bidding war for it, yeah. right? Um, and it won by 69 cents. Uh, they played like wow. $15 million and 69 cents for it um, or something like that. But um, 
Yeah, so this is the Andy Samberg and Krista Milioti uh, time loop film. And coming out in the middle of a pandemic where every day starts to feel the same, I think a lot of people gravitated towards a time loop film. Um, uh, yeah, if I'd known it was coming out this year, it would have been on my most anticipated. But um, yeah, I, I really enjoyed this film. It's a very, very nice watch. AJ, what did you think of it? I liked it. I, I, I was kind of, my expectations were set quite high. Yeah. And I don't think it it eclipsed my expectations um, yeah. unfortunately which is, is such a sucky reason to like be down bad on a movie mm. um but that is sort of what happened was that i i had it built up to me i built it up to my bubble that i watched it with, yeah and then it ended up being like pretty good yeah well, yeah <laughs> like, like that's the thing like it's just a really decent movie it's just a nice movie and it's cool and like, i i did really enjoy it but yeah i was looking forward to this like all year and whereas, and I knew a lot about it, but then I think a lot of people had the fortune of stumbling upon it because that's kind of how everyone describes it as like this unexpected movie that dropped in the middle of the year and it turned mm. everyone's lives around. And it's like, yeah, no, it was just a movie that I was, I was looking forward to and then it, it satisfied my cravings for Palm Springs. Did you see it, Jeremy? I, I literally have no recollection of anyone talking about this movie at all. So, oh. no, no, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> well, you should check it out. It, like, I think you'll like it. It's right. it a very good movie. It's one of those movies, though, where um, I think it, it's a lot more uh, graphically, like sexually graphic than I think people would necessarily expect. Certainly more than I was expecting. And I, well, I sign I, me I, up. Hey. 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 <laughs> I'm well, busting to see because, Andy Samberg. Fuck. Because you never you never know, right? When it's a it's yeah. a comedy, you never know how raunchy it's going to be. And I sort of um, and then they say you know, come built, after I, what? How many minutes? <laughs> <laughs> I I watched it. And, and one of our new flatmates had just moved in. This was actually after lockdown ended. So yeah. um, one of a new flatmate moved in, and I built up this movie, and it like starts with a, a jerking off scene um so <laughs> i yeah. immediately broke into cold sweats being like oh is my new flatmate cool enough oh my god to what if my okay? new flatmate doesn't jerk off <laughs> 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 what if he doesn't know what's going on i think i think you're safe to assume that no matter who your new flatmate is they masturbate okay well i'll ask her um but the everyone the, does uh, everyone does I, I was I was fortunate to have watched it with my flat because this could have very, very easily been hanging out with my parents one night. Hey, shall we watch a movie? Oh yeah, I heard this one's really good. Mm. Like this could this could very easily be a watch with your parents movie and it very much isn't that. <laughs> yeah. I'm very glad for you, AJ. That that's that's a that's a near miss. Um, yeah, yeah. Legit though. It actually was. So another big Big movie of the year, possibly the biggest movie of the year. A tent pole movie. Uh, yes. Uh Tenet. Um so this was oh supposed God. to come out July seventeenth, was delayed two weeks because like, oh well the pandemic will be done by the thirty first of July. <laughs> um and then it wasn't. So they were like, Okay, we'll push it to August twelfth. And then uh it got pushed again to the end of August, and they're like, fuck it, we're just releasing it. Um and so this was actually released, uh New Zealand had a second lockdown in august um just in auckland so oh. aj got to see this like a week before oh. I did. um and you know what and then even when cinemas opened again i was like i actually don't really care that much about seeing it um <laughs> because god boy the wind been taken out of my sails in that week um and yeah it kind of just like this is such an interesting film and it's such a it's because this this was i guess supposed to be the are people ready to go back to cinemas? Um, Christopher Nolan was saying they are. Uh, apparently, well, there's there's now arguments about who was pushing for it and and whatnot. And um, do you know what I reckon? What? I reckon the studios or whoever's try whoever's saying. Like, I reckon studios are basically saying, we can take people not liking us, but Christopher Nolan is a product of ours, and we need people to be on his side. So mm. I wouldn't be surprised if studios were taking the, like, falling on the sword That's and being like, no, 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 we'll preserve you as a figure in film, Twitter, pop culture while while people hate us because they'll still see like i'll still see a warner bros movie if it's yeah. a director i like you know but i yeah. think i think um i think they want to preserve his name you've soured on christopher nolan a bit now uh, I, well i mean the souring of christopher nolan has been a gradual experience over the past mm. six or seven years but not to this not to this uh this this fast i soured on him a lot quicker this year i'm not yeah. completely soured like i still 
I, I genuinely don't think, book. though, that one director could have that much influence over... Well, no, if, if, if any director does, it's it's like... It's Christopher Nolan. Yeah. Like, trying to keep... Oh, my God. Like, the the amount of critical and, like, audience prey and box office um, success he has. And he's, like, yeah. specifically partnered with Warner Brothers. And, I, and also, I guess he is Legendary Pictures as well. So, mm. the, yeah. He is yeah. kind of a, stu- a sort of money studio kind of thing himself. I'd agree if you said that about anyone else, I think, Jeremy, but Nolan might actually yeah. be He's Spielberg level, the most, eh? yeah. Yeah, but also the fact that he's like exclusively Warner Brothers. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, so now to the actual film, Tenet. Um, this was so interesting because it's like, I remember when, the, when the trailer first came out, we might have, I can't remember when it came out, but we might have talked about it in our most anticipated, but I was like, this looks like a parody of a Christopher Nolan film. Like, it, something about it just didn't excite me. It was very like, I don't know, there's something lazy about it, about the idea of it and about like just how mysterious they were trying to be around it. And um, then the film came out and it kind of just had that same feeling. It was like, this is someone trying to do Christopher Nolan. Well, yeah, I had a similar feeling in that when, like I I very much enjoyed the experience of being in the movie. So did I. And, and after soon, being told it was bad, and I then, quite yeah, enjoyed yeah. it. And yeah, and then as soon as the movie <laughs> finished... I I just genuinely haven't spent much time thinking about yeah. it at all because I think it's all head and no heart. Like yeah. there's there's a real I didn't emotionally connect with a single character in that whole movie. Yeah. Whereas there's movies like The Prestige and even Interstellar. Like I I actually really loved Interstellar. I loved the father son the father daughter um, storyline in that. I really like I I felt mm. there were there were moments where I felt things that the characters were feeling yeah and in this movie everything everything was so perfectly polished and hard-edged and it's like christopher nolan had like made everything to perfection in his mind so that you couldn't kind of like argue with it at all like it was just all his own nolanness nolanishness yeah i actually think that like you say all head no heart i don't know if nolan can do both at the same time Mm. I think um I think a lot of his movies are all head. <laughs> um I think Inception's a great example of a film that's all head, but the difference is is that Inception stars someone like Leonardo DiCaprio who's very hard, right? So it balances out same with I'd say the same with The Dark Knight as as a very heady film but it's so packed full of emotionally powerful actors. Mm. And I wonder if Tenor and Interstellar is all heart. He's doing all heart and no head with um, Interstellar, I think. Which is why so many people didn't like Interstellar because it just made no sense. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I think Tenet is all head and none of the... Ca- all, all the actors are also all head, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, I, so I felt very ripped off <laughs> with my experience with this movie, guys, because... I'm mm. I with the trailer comes out. Richard and I we talk to each other every day of the year, right? We're always oh, messaging guys. each other. We are. And and the trailer comes out and Richard's like this looks bad. And I'm like, "Nah, man, you can't. it's Christopher <laughs> Nolan." Like like you go through an evolution as a as a straight white male film fan, right? Where you, where you go from like Is it the five stages of grief? No, no, no. But it's like you with Nolan, you start out, he's your first favorite director. You think he's the he's God's gift to cinema. Um, yeah. and then you grow up a bit and you're like, some of his stuff is legitimately some of the best cinema of our lifetime, but he's a little uh, he's not as smart as he thinks he is. You know, well, yeah, as, the, as the, sort of- he makes he makes the big bang theory. It's like <laughs> mo- movies for dumb people to feel smart because they go. Oh my god! I've heard of Star Trek. He just said the word Star Trek. <laughs> Fuck him! I'm such a nerd. And it's like, well, the the plot's complicated because Elliot Page's character kept on asking questions, um, but then I was asking the same questions. So I'm just as smart as the film. <laughs> sure. So I'm. I was. So my my combating to Richard saying it looked bad was like, listen, I know we're a little bit too cool for Nolan <laughs> at our age, but I think this could still be great. I was very excited for um, John David Washington. I was very excited for um, Robert Pattinson. Um, and I know this didn't happen to everyone, what I'm about to say. Um, and you got COVID. I, know I pooped that- my pants at the cinema. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I got I, COVID I, watching Tenet. 
<laughs> I'm wondering if this was legitimately like a cilantro tastes like soap kind of thing mm. um, where some people have it, some people don't. I could not understand 75% of the dialogue. Yeah, I'm glad you brought film. that up because that's kind of, that was kind of the big thing about it. And like while, while Jeremy and I kind of both said like, I don't think about this, um, you know, after I finished watching it. Um, I was, I, I kept on getting Twitter notifications from Cop Pop Show that tweet, people liking AJ's tweets about, for weeks about the, the, <laughs> the, um, the sound mix. But, um, cause the thing was, I, I knew for like two weeks before I saw it, because, it, you know, because I saw it late, um, that everyone was like, the sound mix is unbearable in this film. Yeah. Like, you cannot understand a single word of dialogue. And Christopher Nolan came out and said, our audiences only need to hear the gist of the dialogue. And then we did a podcast where I hadn't seen Tenet, but AJ and Rowan had. And and I joined along in making fun of his quote. But then I watched the film and I was like, yeah, I got the gist of the dialogue yeah. and that was enough. <laughs> yeah, like, totally. like this, this is why I'm saying I felt ripped off because because I was almost oh, yeah. gaslighted into being the one who will represent the pro tenets. So, you know, I mm. knew at the end of the year when we do part two of Most Disappointing, I will be the the representative for Tenet is good, actually, and Richard will be the one that goes, I was right, it was bad, I said it would be bad, and it completely <laughs> flipped. And I, I felt so shortchanged by destiny, right? <laughs> Like, they're like, like because because as well, like ethically, Richard, I know you you disagree with Nolan and you disagree with this movie coming out and all these things that like, and it sort of felt like together we were going to build up this like great crusade of Tenet being a really bad thing that happened, and then despite all that, you were like, I thought it was all right, and I was like, no, <laughs> <laughs> like, I don't know what to say now. Um, you but, were the look, chosen I, I, one. <laughs> you were supposed to restore all. To, to, to Nolan, not destroy him. <laughs> the 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 audio mix um, conversation has many different people talking about it, um, and many different perspectives on it. I legitimately, legitimately think it could be a situation of the speakers in your cinema were better than the speakers in mine. Um, but that being said, I did see this with Rowan, who later said that he understood a lot more of the dialogue than I did. But the point being, and it's 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 also like other people saying, oh, it's too loud and that's why you can't hear it. And maybe that's part of it, but I think a big issue as well is the actors aren't articulating their lines. If, mm. if, if say, a line of dialogue from Robert Pattinson is, um, it's, say the line is like, uh, I'm going to shoot a gun and the bullet is going to come back into the gun right mm. he doesn't say it like that he goes i'm gonna shoot the gun and come back into the gun and it's like yeah. what it, i heard four words and, and then john david washington's like <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, about and then Kenneth the Brand is like i'm on a yacht you can't <laughs> hear a thing uh, yeah, about halfway through the film, it cuts to Kenneth Branagh, Elizabeth Debicki, and um, John David Washington on a yacht with masks on, like, talking to America's each other via Cup hydrofoiling catamaran. Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and so the whole movie, I'm already just without anything covering their faces, struggling to make out what they're actually saying. And then mm. they go to a yacht with masks on, speaking through garbled radio. And I almost like audibly went, "Oh fuck you, Nolan!" Like it's like he's <laughs> it's like he's making fun of me. It's you know, it's yeah. like he goes from from like uh, it's it's like because th- because this started. Let's be honest, this started years ago with uh, the Dark Knight Rises. You know. Yeah. Bane, Bane oh. you couldn't like famously had to be re-recorded because no one could understand well, remixed, him. Anyway. Remixed and in the actual movie, it's still pretty hard to understand <laughs> him, right? And at, when I saw the Dark Knight Rises, I assumed it was a me problem. I assumed, you know, obviously a the, the one of the greatest working directors isn't going to fuck up something you learn in film school on day one, which is audio is more important than video. Um and so I was like, it's probably a me problem. And then um, Interstellar came out and it's the same problem. And Michael Caine is delivering the twist of the film and I can't hear what he's saying. Mm. And it's like, okay. I can't even hear the gist. I, 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 I genuinely can't. want you to do a YouTube video where you like break up with Christopher Nolan and you deliver the line, <laughs> Chris, I've realized it's not me. 
It's the fact that you hate ADR. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe. And then um, you just then have Dunkirk to go with live comes- sound. You can't re-record. <laughs> Then Dunkirk comes out and like in with the benefit of hindsight, I would say the inaudible dialogue in Dunkirk is the platonic ideal of what he's actually claiming he's doing. D- Dunkirk is, is and, and I've said this uh, a few times, but like after Dark Knight Rises, we were like, okay, we know what, what Christopher Nolan is. Let's see his next big original thing. And then he split off into two. And all of the bad Christopher Nolan trope, the like the the bad Christopher Nolan made Interstellar, and the good one made Dunkirk, and then I think uh, Tenor is the second one from the Interstellar Christopher Nolan. It's like, yeah, like like you take all the <laughs> it's like the it's, one the one for you, one for me, director studio relationship. <laughs> yeah, but it, it is. Um, <laughs> but because Dunkirk is like, yeah, it's it's the perfect idea of. All right, well, he's kind of all style, no substance. So let's make a film where substance doesn't really matter. There's not much dialogue in it anyway. You do actually just get the gist. It's an experience. Um, yeah, like like Tom Hardy is like, yeah, you might not be able to super understand it, but you know, okay, like he taps his fuel gauge. Okay, he must be talking about how he's almost out of fuel. You get the de- desperation. Yeah. Um, and, and that's kind of like, the, you could watch Dunkirk silent like with the sound off yes. and you would follow the story. Yes, and what's crazy about that is that it implies Nolan's aware of this, <laughs> whereas Tenet implies mm. he's completely unaware of it, right? Yeah, like, like, like Dunkirk makes... felt like a response to Interstellar. Well, no, but like, sure. you watch Tenet, and it's almost like you, you get the feeling that Christopher Nolan's been, like, trawling the Reddit threads, and then he's just like, you know what, Reddit? <laughs> Fuck you. Here you go. Here's something to talk about. I'm going to make you risk your fucking life <laughs> to watch this movie. And so I, we actually did a collab with uh, Centro, Row, the, the YouTube channel, for a video over on Centro's Row's channel. Um, called, it's called, like, The Problem with Christopher Nolan Sound Mix or something. And I'm in it basically going ham, basically saying, like, Dunkirk is kind of genius, right? Dunkirk is, is like, a, almost a smart-ass response to people saying they couldn't understand a distiller, right? And, it's, and it works, and that's what's so great about it, is that this, this fuck you to critics of a uh, is actually a better film than Interstellar and possibly possibly Nolan's finest work, I'll say it. Um, mm. And But then right. with Tenet, it's like... In, in the t- so so the argument is boils down to in the text of the film it makes sense that you can't hear anything in Dunkirk and the film is designed so that you don't actually have to understand what people are saying in Dunkirk. But Tenet, man, is so... It's it's about something. It is about a very specific set of rules that are communicated to you, the audience member. It is so story based and so dialogue based, and it's it's a film that demands you pay attention to what is happening in mm. the story. Like all the dialogue like, is just exposition. Well, and, yeah, and exactly. And also, the the difference between Dunkirk and Tenet is that Dunkirk is an elevator pitch, right? Yeah. Like you can tell mm. someone, like the, the trailer promises you, "Hey, all these men need to get home, but will they get will they get help before the enemy arrives to yeah. kill them all?" Including Harry Styles. And Tenet is like, <laughs> okay, so this absolute paradox that could never happen is happening in some way. We have no idea why, and we have no idea how. But if we don't understand it, the world is going to end as we know it. But we don't know how it would end. We also don't know how it would be fixed. But let these characters explain it to you as they do it. Yeah. And here's them explaining. <laughs> do you guys you guys know about how... Uh, we'll, we'll wrap up on Tenet. But um, you know how roosters have like a thing that goes... I'm <laughs> really looking forward to this. <laughs> a thing like that that shuts the air canals when they, when they do their crow. Um, oh, yes. Because it's so loud, you know, shatter the eardrums. Um, <laughs> do you think AJ's ears do that during a heist film, and that's what happened? <laughs> <laughs> I th- here's here's my final word on Tenet. It is a real shame that our entire conversation on Tenet has been about a technical aspect and not about the story or what happens in it or the acting or any of the things that I love Nolan films for. And I yeah. feel very kicked out of the clubhouse that Nolan has committed to this philosophy on sound design because 
The Dark Knight is one of my favorite movies of all time. I think Inception, what a film. It might be it might be the defining film of that generation and we can all understand those films and he's not excluding anyone. And now three films in a row, three four films in a row, he's made movies where he seems to want to make it sound like all the dialogue is underwater. And it's such I feel so yeah, I just I feel kicked out of the clubhouse and I feel um like I can't enjoy them anymore unless he changes and he should change because he came out and said that other directors have yeah. asked him to change. Oh, um <laughs> It is important. Dialogue is, it, in my opinion, dialogue, unless under very specific circumstances, should be crystal clear, beyond realistic. Yeah. You know, I'm not looking for realistic dialogue. I would rather hear exactly what someone's saying than have like be like, well, you know, there was a loud truck next to them, so of course you wouldn't be able to. I don't want that. I want to be given that. Yeah. You know, I want to be able it's, to. It's the same them, way that no you enjoy what. having a soundtrack behind what's mm. going on. Precisely. Um, also, um, final word on this is just fuck you, Christopher Nolan, you egotistical prick. If you're so concerned about the fucking uh, theatrical experience, you should have been the first film to delay yourself and wait until play- it's safe. That, like it's it's actually fucking disgusting that you would do this. You make me sick. Yeah. <laughs> and since you so, guys have had final you words, my final word on Tenet would be imagine Michelle Williams instead of Elizabeth Debicki. I think that would have been I really just, like Elizabeth Debicki. I like her, but I think that she was <laughs> She's part, too tall. I think that she was part of what made the film too kind of hard and polished and shiny. I think that's also just a Nolan writing woman problem though. Sure, yeah. but I think that Michelle Williams could have gotten like, around what, it. The the one line of dialogue I actually heard in the film was like when they're like <laughs> the the whatever the big the big bad it will kill everyone in the whole world, and she goes, including my son. <laughs> and it's it's like actually, yes. this is the yeah. one line I've heard. <laughs> yeah, the um, my son so memes I, that I, came I out of that cracked up in the, in the theater and that. <laughs> um, so I would say I would say this is probably fi- my most final disappointing of the year. <laughs> Uh, this is my yeah, most that's, disappointing that's pretty, of the year. Pretty fair. My my most disappointing is Christopher Nolan as a human being, um, and the yeah, sure. the lack of respect he showed for his fans by releasing Tenet. I mean, I get that it's like yeah, you want to give them what you want, but my God, like wait till it's safe. I mean, we all still went and saw it though. Yeah. <laughs> this is Nolan's first truly bad movie, in my opinion. Hmm. Uh, all right, Bob's Burgers did not come out. Coming out April next year. Jungle Cruise, <laughs> we're very excited for um, July thirtieth next year. Jungle um, Cruise year. could easily be good. <laughs> it could Jungle easily Cruise be a great Jungle time. Cruise will be next year's tenant. I'm calling it now. Um, <laughs> so um, premium VOD. I hope you guys had forty bucks spare um, so you could buy <laughs> Mulan um, oh, and, uh, plus a Disney Plus subscription. Um, so Mulan came out. This was this was. It was interesting around this time when they were like, okay, well, we need people to watch movies. How can we do it? Warner Brothers was like, well, let's just put movies in theater, see if people come. And then they also, they like didn't release accurate stats uh, for the film. They they said their opening weekend was a certain amount, but that actually included the entire week beforehand uh, and in Canada as well, not just the US, but like, okay. yeah, made so much money opening weekend. But the fact that they haven't had any other big releases and they've actually got another plan for next year shows it probably didn't work. Um, Mulan was Disney's uh, way of trying that to see, will people pay, pay a premium price, $40 in New Zealand, $30 in the US, um, to get access to like a brand new film. Um, I think there's a world in which this could work. If they'd been able to release it in countries where it was safe to release things, that could have been fine. If it was, you could pay 30 bucks if, in, instead of getting Disney Plus and it was maybe 10 bucks if you had it or something like that, I would have been willing to get on board with it. But um, or if the it fact wasn't they did this, Yeah, the fact they did this, this <laughs> yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. the shady business practice with what a fucking terrible film. My God, did you watch it, Jeremy? No, absolutely not. Oh, so They bad. didn't do it with um, with Hamilton. But imagine if they did mm. this with Hamilton. No one would even yeah. be complaining if they did this with Hamilton. Yeah. I, I would have because, gladly paid that yeah. for Hamilton. I, I also, leave the record show, I didn't pay for Mulan. I knew people who worked on it who had a password that they shared around. 
I, I, I flagrantly just pirated it to watch it. Um, but like, imagine if they did this with Hamilton. Hamilton is so good that we wouldn't have even realized the ethical quandaries involved yeah. in yeah. this production. I would have been model. thanking them. Mm. I would have been thanking mm. them for making me pay mm. thirty bucks, yeah. forty bucks. Yeah, yeah. Um, but so anyway, Mulan. It's a retelling of the um, the nineties Disney film without all the fun. Um, yeah, without all the fun, out of the songs, no Mushu. And you know what? Yeah, I, I don't even I don't even really know Mulan that well. Um, but I, yeah, like so I don't, I didn't care if they took out Mushu. If if China were offended by it, then yeah, whatever, it should be taken out. Like it's stupid. Um, or maybe it isn't. I don't know. I don't really. Yeah. <laughs> um, but the. Um, but this film, it's like, I understand the original is about like, you know, this woman who uses her like wits and her courage to overcome everything. And this one, it's about a girl who happens to have magic powers and is just magically stronger than all the men. And it like, yeah, it, it's just, it's so lazy. And it's like, this isn't what people want. This isn't like why people, mm. yeah, like this isn't feminism. It is astonishingly bad at being feminist. Um, there's a great yeah. video I'll recommend by Accented Cinema, who basically goes Fantastic. over how um, Mulan 2020 is just a complete failure of feminism. Um, and on top of that, it also kind of looks shit. There's some pretty wonky CGI in it. Oh, um, and the, the, the wire work is awful yeah um i did know one of the, we, we talked about this i'm sure i knew one of the actors of yeah. it and all in the entire promotional lead up to mulan i've been i'm sure i've said it on the podcast like oh my god i wish i stayed in contact with this person we could have got a, an exclusive interview for the show now i'm kind of glad that didn't happen because i would have to be like hey man uh, this is your big break. And I thought it was not only a bad movie, but an offensive movie and shouldn't have been made. <laughs> you should be ashamed. Um, yeah. Which is a bummer because this was also, this was hyped up to be Disney's best live action remake yet. You know? Yeah, because they're and, like, they're I taking mean, it seriously. They're getting rid of yeah, the, yeah. You know, they've yeah. got a woman director, so it's going to be feminist. Mm. Yeah, and in in retrospect, I do kind of almost feel like it's one of the lesser ones. Ultimately, like, and I think it has. A, I, I, it might be the worst. It, well, it, it um it has a higher Ron Tomato score, I think, than um than like Lion King and stuff. But yeah, in retrospect, I feel like thing. it's it's way more of a blow than the yeah. other ones i guess like yeah th this is actually yeah like you say it's not only bad it's actually offensive um and it's just yeah it, it's very like because also the fact that there was like no one chinese involved in it and it's like you know it was directed by a white woman um the the production designers were all white and it's like th this is such a missed opportunity mm. like why would you not get yeah, and yeah, it, and it, it feels like a boardroom of of middle aged white men being like, okay, well, how do we write a feminist film? Okay, well, what if she's strong? It's like, okay, sweet. And also, like in this but, film but, as but well, like she the whole can't she can't be strong as a man as a woman. So mm. let's make her a magic woman. And also the whole the whole thing of like, so she ties her hair up, and then the big dramatic reveal is that when she pulls takes her hair down, and they're like, oh my god, it's a woman, and it's like. You all have long hair. That's what it would all look like if any of you took your hair down. But it's like, no, only a woman would, would take it's, their hair out. It's the equivalent of like the glasses being taken off to reveal yeah, that yeah, the, yeah. the art nerd was always a hot girl. That actually comes up later yeah. on in, the, in this <laughs> podcast as well. And look, that would be fine. Um, that That's exactly what it is in the cartoon as well. But in a cartoon, you're already one layer of reality mm. removed. So you can believe that the characters in the world of the film see things a different way. It's a lot more confronting um, when it's live action. Um, and the funniest thing about this film is that it gives the hawk from the original film a tragic backstory where it turns out they're actually a witch that is transformed into a hawk. Um, very funny yeah, stuff. Yeah, but very she's also cool. a girl, and so her and Mulan feel a sense of kinship. Yeah, exactly. So the, the, I this think... is one of those films where it's like it feels like, oh, of course they're going to shit on the female lead Disney movie with a female director, but it's like, no, it's not doing these things well enough. <laughs> Which is something we've done before. Um, and I'd also like to point out though that um, 
I was one of the only one of us who liked Birds of Prey, so um, I'm still shit. I've still got enough feminist points to. Um, oh, to can win we not do like this? Birds of Prey is like a, a <laughs> so uncomfortable right Birds now. Birds of Prey at the end, now at, at, at the end of the year, people are saying that Birds of Prey was like one of the top films of the year, and it's like to me, it's a, a taking crazy pills thing. I've I, I I'd put it sixteenth, which I think is fair. Not my top ten, but it's still better than. Um, let's see here. Uh, it's SpongeBob the movie. <laughs> that's that's the that's one of the films I think it's better than. Well, no spoilers for the rest of the podcast. But um, just after this, we got an American Pickle, which um, we didn't watch. But AJ, did you want to quickly give your thoughts on that? It is a fine, okay movie. What's it, it about? Is, it's about Seth Rogen um, as a as a modern day man. Um, and but a hundred years ago, his grandfather, who's also or his great great grandfather, who's also played by Seth Rogen, um, left Russia to come to America um, and work in a pickle factory, where he fell in a big barrel of brine by accident, and then the pickle factory closed down, um, and they left him in the brine. And a hundred years later, he wakes up. And he's like, I am Seth Rogen from a hundred years ago. And him and <laughs> Seth Rogen from 2020 <laughs> um, team up. And it's all right. I mean, there's, there's, um, there, it, it comments a bit on cancel culture in a really funny way. Oh. Um, because he's like a, um, hundred year old man and he, he gets, they, they have like a falling out midway through the movie. Um, and the pickle man, the, the hundred year old, the grandfather, um, gets really it becomes like a viral pickle salesman on the streets of New York, and it, like it, it's it's really like kitsch. Like he sells using um recycled jars, and he collects the water with it's rainwater and stuff like that. Mm. Um, and so it's like it's like a big fad for for um like kitsch New Yorkers. Um, and then it obviously comes out that he's like horrifically sexist and homophobic <laughs> and, and racist. Um, which is really funny because that's so true. Um, and it comments on cancel culture in a way that's not like the way that generation x is commenting on it which makes you roll your eyes because you know it's not like oh you can't say anything these days it's (laughs) like no you can't say anything these days and the that's a good thing you know um so it tackles it better than like say Todd Phillips (laughs) tackled it when talking about Joker listening to you describe the plot of that movie I'm like how the hell did that get financial backing? <laughs> no, it's a, I think it's an Amazon Prime film. Uh, uh, right. HBO Max. Or, or HBO Max. Um, yeah. But and also it was pretty like, low budget. It's not very. It's yeah, because really, but yeah. it's said the old Seth Rogen has a big beard and the new one doesn't, and the, it's actually a beard that he shaved and then shot the other half of the film. Oh my gosh! Yeah, yeah. yeah. Which is pretty impressive. Yeah. All right, uh, personal history of David Copperfield. I think this came out. It did. Did it you did. watch it? It did come out. I didn't get a chance. To Jeremy, watch it. I feel like I've been I've heard you talk about this movie yeah. for six years. I know. I'm like I you know, I actually I I have this movie ready to go and I I just know that it's a movie that my wife will really enjoy and so I've been waiting for an opportunity for us to watch it together and I have not. You haven't watched it? I haven't oh watched it. God. I'm sorry. <laughs> Um, it looks so good okay. and all the reviews are amazing so i'm, yeah. I'm looking um, forward to it in 2021 <laughs> uh bill and ted face the music um this is another one that's like there's been you know it's crazy to think this actually came out um but this was a video on demand release i think it had a limited theatrical release as well um by all accounts it was pretty good or like yeah not that, not actually that bad that was kind of the review i, I heard i of. think it was like such low expectations of a reanimation of the ability yeah and idea. also just like you know there is it gets a little bit of leeway for being one of the only films to release this year but i i did i've never seen either of the what any of the bill and ted films so i would have seen it had i seen them but you know i well, I'll say this is that it'll be a film franchise, Fortnite's episode one day. Yeah. So oh, no, none of us ended up seeing it, but we will yeah. talk about it on Cole Pop Chicken and it's uh, um but in August, um the first in the first hour of this podcast, we went through one month, and now in the in the following two minutes, we're already through another month. Um <laughs> because the new mutants came out at the end of August. Um this finally came out. What a ah! And what a moment for all of us. We can all go home now. Yeah, <laughs> turn off the podcast. This has been 
like I know this has been every every podcast, movie podcast inside joke. We're not claiming to be the podcast that makes mm. jokes about new mutants getting delayed all the time, but it did become somewhat special for us specifically because we do this every year and this has been s- supposed to have come out every year for the past four or five episodes of, mm. of most disappointing um we did cover this in our patreon podcast um so i probably won't talk about it to the same extent that i talked about it um on there you're gonna have to pay five dollars baby to get <laughs> that um but suffice to say um it's not very good. It's maybe one of the worst films a 20-year f- franchise could end on. Um, <laughs> and uh, there's a lot wrong with it and not a lot right with it. Um, the 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 I've, I'd made a video about this for the One Excellent Scene playlist um, talking about how, sure, it doesn't look that great, but um, there's, it's cool that the X-Men superhero cinematic universe was trying out other genres. Um, you know, they could have made this much more of a horror than it actually was. Yeah, that was kind of the main um, th- my main takeaway from it is that like for as bold as the trailer kind of the stance it took, it was a very tame movie. Like the, the bit I remember in the trailer that made me think like, oh my God, I might actually even watch this movie because I'll be too scared um, <laughs> is when he, uh, one of the main characters uh, like, looks into a dryer and the thing fills with flames and and it's a jump scare um and in the actual movie there's a cut between when he looks in and when it fills with flames so it makes it not a jump scare um because like the scene builds so that him looking into a dryer filled with flames makes sense <laughs> like there's a whole scene in between it um and it's just it's yeah. shit like that that's so bizarre and it's because the the director of it did uh, The Fault in Our Stars was his biggest movie. And it's like, why are you not getting a horror director to do this? Um, yeah. Because, like, yeah, horror... It's not like you're spoiled for choice. Almost every director in the world started out doing horrors, so... Yeah, like, like every big blockbuster director these days started with horror. So when you're actually making a horror blockbuster, why would you get the guy who did The Fault in Our Stars? Did you see it, Jeremy? No, absolutely not. You guys warned me off of it. Mm. Well, good. Oh well, X Men's over now. Everybody, pack up and go home. Which is <laughs> it's so f- it, the best the best testament to to how a much of a drop in the water this movie was is that when Dark Phoenix came out, that was celebrated as the final movie in the X Men saga. Even though everyone knew New Mutants was still to come out, and then when New Mutants did come out, it was not celebrated as the final movie in the X Men saga. Yeah. No one really talked about it, and this was also one of those things where, like, was this a like this was a unethical release as well, wasn't it? There was a big boycott in um sort of our YouTuber circles because that's right, um, yeah. a lot of the filmy guys didn't want to go see it because it came out just at, at one of the i was going to say the high points of covid outbreaks in america i'm sure it's not now oh, it looks like yeah, it's <laughs> peanuts compared to the numbers they're getting now <laughs> but at the time it was like you shouldn't go see this so a lot of youtubers it was like oh my god hundreds of people are dying a day and it's like <laughs> yeah i mean i, I wish things um, were that good again <laughs> and so a lot of people would refuse to make like reviews of it and content on it because they didn't want to encourage, to encourage to going it. to see it and all that for a movie that wasn't that good in fact i'm looking at my my top movies and by and large the ones that were supposed to go to streaming were the were better than the ones that managed to yeah. creepily sneak their way back into cinemas mm. you know so what did they lose what did you lose hollywood probably not a lot because you still made money mm. um i guess but um so uh another funny thing that uh so quiet place part two is the first film i remember being delayed it was the week of its release and they said, oh, we'll chuck it in September. Things will be fine then. <laughs> um, and now it's uh, been delayed for, uh, almost a full year from its initial release date to April 23rd next year. Uh, or this year, sorry. But um, on September 4th, we got uh, the first live action film from Charlie Kaufman in over a decade with I'm Thinking of Ending Things. Um, Charlie Kaufman's one of my favorite writers, favorite directors. I mean, he's only directed a couple of films, but um, yeah, I love his, his, his writing. And so I was very yep. excited to get a new film from him. Um, and 
this was on my most anticipated for the year and it's my second favorite film of the year after hamilton nice i've got it at number at number five as my, I, I thought this was great, man. Mm. It's it's a rare one, a rare case of a movie I don't understand at all, but I still really enjoy <laughs> yeah. it. Um, it's it's so fucking atmospheric. It's such a juicy, tasty movie mm. because it's so creepy and interesting and fun. The acting in it is great. Um, the the writing is great. The directing is great. I think it's Charlie Kaufman's. I think it's the best film he's directed. I don't know if it's the best film he's written. But. yeah sure it's uh yeah and because like it's only really got four actors in it um jesse plemons david thulis tony collette no is it tony collette yes yeah and um jesse buckley all like th- four of the best actors working in tv yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. And then, now they're in now they all star in a movie together actually three out of those four have been in seasons of fargo mm. as well different seasons even because um jesse plemons is in season two uh david thulis is in season three and jesse buckley is in season four yeah which i finished but, recently uh, congratulations um it, it is a very like yeah creeps up on you and it's one of those films that you're like at the start of it you're like oh something's a little off by the about this and then you're like but maybe it's just me or maybe maybe it's a film or maybe i noticed a mistake and then midway through the film you're like something's definitely off about this and then the third, at the end of the film you're like oh okay <laughs> there's a lot off um, about the film and just you know we, we probably won't talk spoilers because this is a go and watch it kind of film um, yeah. if you haven't seen it uh, jeremy you didn't see it no but it was really funny because i i got the scent i saw your letterbox like rankings of this film mm. and then uh, i was like oh okay that's interesting um, and then I like literally had not seen anything about it. And then I was at a um, barbecue and I heard two people, two of my friends go like, oh my God, guys, we just watched this awful movie last night. Yeah, Do yeah, yeah, not yeah. watch Absolutely. it. It's called yeah, I'm yeah, Thinking yeah, of yeah. Ending Things. And then someone goes, oh my God, I watched that as well. It's so shit. What even is about that movie? Like, yeah. And like this whole group just like piled on how terrible they <laughs> yeah. thought this movie. And I was like, you guys are obviously you guys are obviously not Charlie Kaufman yeah. fans, so <laughs> probably not for you. <laughs> may I inquire? May I inquire, Jeremy, as to the um, the normie levels of this friend group? <laughs> oh, that's why I said you guys are probably not Charlie Kaufman yes, fans. Yeah. Like, <laughs> and it is um, like, unabashedly this is a a filmies movie. This is yeah, one hundred percent. It's the kind much. of film that. I can't be bothered defending. If like someone would go, oh, fuck, I watched that. It was <laughs> so shit, eh? I'd be like, yeah, man. It's art. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thing, man. It's, like, when, when it comes <laughs> down to a question of art, it's yeah. like either you looked at that painting and saw something in it or you didn't. Yeah. And that like, you, can't, you can't argue with that. It's just you don't get what the artist was doing. And yeah. that's fine. But yeah. you'll probably judge the person who doesn't get but it. But this is a classic <laughs> film. And, I've, and again, I spoke about this a few times there. Um it's it sucks that it's getting released on Netflix because the wrong people are watching it because people go mm. oh well I enjoyed Holiday and I enjoyed um, the Old Guard <laughs> and Christmas um, Chronicles too Christmas Chronicles too I'll chuck on I'm thinking of anything because uh, Netflix movies tend to be good right you know um fucking uh, Operation Christmas Drop um uh, ho- uh what was the Falling in Love I'll put on I'm thinking of anything it sounds like a romantic drama um. And then you watch these films that are like these incredible filmmakers um, or, you know, uh, like Martin Scorsese doing something different with uh, The Irishman. You go, oh, cool. I love Goodfellas. I'm Kiefer. Shoot him up. And no, it's like he's actually really doing something different. Marriage Story is a classic example of like, no, this is not like a it's more intelligent than, than well, you're expecting a, just scrolling listen, through a Netflix quotes movie. Netflix movie. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a film. It's the Criterion it's, Collection. It's in the Criterion yeah. Collection. Like, yeah. that, that's all you need to know about Marriage Story. Um, uh, hey, let's, you know, got to say it, best title of the year, probably. I'm mm. thinking of ending things. I think that's such a compelling title. Um, also, best trailer of the year. Um, I watched the Which trailer I didn't before watch. the film. Richard, you didn't. Yeah, yeah. Um, and because I was like, I'm going to watch it. I like, don't need to be convinced. <laughs> um, real, I, Jeremy, you should watch the trailer if you're not going to watch the film because it's very fun. And a re- I can't remember if it does this in the movie or not, but 
um, in the trailer at least, it might be in the movie as well, the line I'm thinking of ending things is said through voiceover quite a few times. Um, but yeah. every time it's said, it's cut off one word earlier. So like the first time yeah. you hear it, it's like, I'm thinking of ending things. And the second time it's like, I'm thinking of ending th And then they get interrupted and it's, I'm thinking of... And you know, like it, yeah. it does that all the way through the trailer, and I think through the film, and it's a really, it really plays with your mind because the way it, and almost as an, as the opposite of Tenet, the way it plays with dialogue is something mm. I've never heard in a movie before. Because you you wind up being like because it's all about like her her voiceover is getting interrupted, and he, yeah, and yeah. it's like she'll be doing voiceover, and he's like, did you say something? And it's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it, it's very disconcerting because it opens with like a thirty minute just car ride. Um mm. and but it's very the the dialogue's very gripping. Ah, I need to watch it again, man. It's so good. All right, that is part one for you. Hope you guys enjoyed that. Part two will be out next week. Um, so if you if you liked this this episode and you liked the show, if you've never heard it before, please, um, first of all. Uh, weird episode to start on but also please consider liking and subscribing to cop pop show on all our different platforms we're on facebook youtube instagram um twitter um letterboxd as i've said a thousand times um where else are we we're on patreon patreon.com slash cop pop if you want to donate to us and of course join our discord as well um and yeah check out all the stuff in the show notes and um we'll see you next week and stay tuned for the post credit scene as soon as i stop talking all right everybody we'll see you next time all right and back from my outro to the post credit scene hey i'm back um, and Richard's back. How are you, Richard? Yeah, good. And Jeremy's back. Oh, yeah, good night. It's me, Jeremy. Sorry for the abrupt ending to that um, episode, but this is the post credit scene where if you pay us $5 or more on our Patreon, you get to give us something to talk about at the end of each episode. Um, and today's uh, post credit scene comes to us from Luke. He asks, what are your favorite couch gags and chalkboard gags in The Simpsons? um richard what are your favorite ch couch gags and chalk or chalk and chalk gags <laughs> um so Simpsons? couch gag um i i am a fan of don hertzfeld's one i do hear i have some of his work tattooed on my body um and uh he's like because they got guest animators um and i am very close to getting his homer octopus tattooed um, because it's like a, I currently only have Simpsons or Don Hertzfeld tattoos, and so it'd be mm. fun to get a combination of the two. Um, nice. So that one, that one, I really like. Um, and what I, like, it's funny because the like obviously you know Simpsons is the greatest show of all time, um, and I grew up with it. But the ones that are kind of coming to mind are the later ones where they're kind of being a bit more experimental with them. There's the Guillermo del Toro one. There's a Banksy one. The Rick and Morty one. Wubble Wubble Dub Dub um mm. but like yeah because because the classic ones are more just like a very quick joke whereas they kind of became an art form later on but there's the um the classic circus one which is the one where it's the law it was the longest one in those kind of first few seasons and it was used quite a lot and so they used that when an episode was running short to yeah, yeah. um when they needed and a few extra seconds on it um but there is there is one um with freddie and jason waiting for um it's in the Trials of Horror, I think number ten, maybe. Um, okay, nice. Then waiting for the shot, but um, and uh, do you want to do couch gag? Then I can do chalkboard. Well, my um, my favorite is a combination of the two, which is in the two hundredth episode of The Simpsons. Um, it, it's a shorter start, um, and they as they run in as the family run towards the couch, they actually run into the classroom where Bart is standing there writing, I will not screw with the opening, uh, with the, with the opening sequence with the opening or something. Credits, yeah. yeah that, and I did, I'd, I'd never seen that before, or at least I didn't remember seeing it. Um, and I thought that was quite funny. Yeah. Um, and that's uh, trash of the Titans, I believe is the 200th episode. I think so. Yeah. Um, my, the 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 couch gag that sticks out to me that really gets me is um, 
after Marsha Wallace passed away, who's the voice of Edna Krabappel, um, there's a couch gag where, or the chalkboard gag where it's Bart standing in front of the chalkboard. There's only one line written on it, and it says, "We'll really miss you, Mrs. K." And that's really sweet. I remember. I think I, I must have seen a picture of it, or I saw, or I read that that was what was what it was that week, and it, I got choked up just like reading it. And then I saw the episode years later, not realizing that that would be the episode that it was. And yeah, I got choked up again. It's it's a very powerful image, and I have a I have a very soft spot for animated tributes to people. Mm. Yes, we talked about that on the Muppets. We episode, did talk about that on the Muppets episode, but yeah, it's 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 kind of speaking to that. Yeah, nice. 